Welcome to America's Talking. Today, I am pleased to be speaking with Zach McClellan. Zach is a former major league pitcher for the Colorado Rockies, a CEO and entrepreneur, and a frequent lecturer on college campuses. Zach, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. So I grew up, we were talking a little bit before the show, my dad's family is from central Illinois, and they are closer to St. Louis than they are to Chicago. And so I'm a Cardinals fan living in Chicago. Baseball's been around me my whole life. But in preparation for our our talk today, I was thinking about what effect playing baseball had on my life. And it was a lot less than everything else around the sport of baseball. It was more about my family and my connection to my dad. And the reason I didn't have a great connection with playing baseball was because my last season was in fourth grade in Little League in Hinsdale, Illinois. I struck out and I muttered a curse word. It was the F word under my, under my breath, immediate ejection. I free, like I'm freaking out. I'm so embarrassed. I have to go home. My mom drives me home. She has the uh, phone. She gets the phone number ultimately for the umpire for me to apologize to the umpire. I still remember it to this day. I found the number and I threw it in the backyard somewhere. So I, she could, no one could find the number to call the umpire. I was so embarrassed. I had to apologize to my whole team. And that was my last season of baseball. And it was, it's hard for me to divorce that from like, was that a good thing that I stopped or I ended up playing different sports uh, throughout high school? But it made me think a lot about quitting. And you work a lot with youth and obviously in your own career is really successful. At some point, you probably thought you needed to quit. But how should we think about kids, especially that age, like fourth, fifth, sixth grade, wanting to quit something or having feelings about, uh, you know, athletics? I feel like quitting has such a huge impact on people's lives, but we don't talk about it very much. Right. Yeah. And, and it's really easy to quit. Right. So it's the easiest thing ever. Right. It's, it's little easier. Right. So I would say that I have thought about quitting uh, at least thousands of times, uh, not just while I was playing baseball, but in business. And, you know, the, the, the thought creeps in your head all the time. Like it would just be so much easier not to deal with this right now. And, you know, when you're when you have kids and they, they don't have great role models in some cases, uh, a lot of cases, they might have been around others that quit on them. Uh, what ends up happening is, you know, it's really important as a role model or as a coach or as a mentor or even as a player is you have to represent the mental toughness to not quit yourself. I mean, that to me, that's number one. I respected adults who stuck by me through uh, the ups and downs. And the reality is um, in this day and age with social media and the ability to get instant access to information, all of your flaws are exposed to the world now. And it makes it a lot easier to quit because when people realize that you're, you're challenged, which we all really are, but you know, the reality is social media, people want to always publicize their, their strengths, right? How great they are. Well, then when you show your, your weaknesses on social media, it's real easy to just try to crawl in a ball and quit. But the reality is um, you're, you're only hurting yourself. So w- when I am in the situation, I think about the times when, you know, I, I came into high school baseball as a sophomore. Uh, I was a JV MVP as a freshman, junior varsity. Uh, my sophomore year, I made the JV team again. And so I, I got cut from varsity baseball as a sophomore. I had mm. to repeat JV. I talked, told my dad, I'm, I'm done. I'm quitting baseball. I was already getting D1 basketball offers at the time. My dad said, no, you know, we're going to, we're just going to play this out a little longer and just see what, what the end lies. Was it Michael Jordan who was cut as a freshman or was he a sophomore when he was cut? Sophomore. So you're just like Michael Jordan. In other yeah, words. yeah. 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 That's the only thing we have in common right there. <laughs> um, but you know, it just, I just think back to that that critical moment in my life, and if my role model had told me, yeah, you know what, it, um, they mistreated you or whatever, you know, that, you know, it's on them. My dad just told me, look in the mirror. Is there anything you can do better? Yeah, you know, I was a JV MVP the second year in a row, and then the, the next year, my junior year, I was first team All State. So the reality is. Um, it really comes down to, do you live it yourself? Can people look at you and, and think that you're telling the truth? And then they'll follow you. If if you show any wavering on them at all, I mean, especially in this generation of youth, they're so used to um, the, the adult role models quitting on them that they just, they kind of expect you to let them down. 
So when your dad did that, what do you think made him do that? Was it because of what he saw in you as a potential baseball player, as, as someone who could exceed in that, or what was it? So my, my dad, um, you know, he, his big thing for me was always, you know, don't be your own worst enemy. Like if you're going to fail, fail because you tried your hardest and you just were not good enough. Um, and, and you're going to run into a lot of barriers along the way, but, but those barriers are only building character. They're not, they're not barriers that are going to last a lifetime. They're barriers that are going to last a year, a month, a week, a day. Um, you know, and, and I just remember numerous occasions talking to my dad about quitting all the time. I mean, it used to be the joke in my family that, well, this week, Zach's going to talk about quitting. It was so cathartic as a kid to to just whine in the car to say I quit on the way to practice or whether it's a sport or uh, an instrument. It's just soothing in a way to talk about quitting. And my brothers were, would laugh at me and, you know, eventually it just became a joke. And it's funny because my story is about perseverance now. That's what's funny. If you look at my track mm. record and the way I got to the major leagues, it mm. wasn't the fast route and I wasn't there very long. Right. So um, what that taught me is that all those lessons they were they were sharing with me along the way. I mean, it paid off in a huge way. And now it's impacting my businesses. It's impacting my own family. It's impacting the kids that I try to mentor. And, you know, I just I think, in my opinion, that's that is our responsibility in our generation is to show that you can persevere, even though all of your faults are going to be exposed worldwide. So when is it appropriate to quit? Like in your dad's view, it seemed like if you tried your hardest, then maybe you could quit. But but when should we quit anything? When when should we allow our kids to quit anything? Well, I would tell them until they take the uniform away, you know, you don't quit. Like to me, okay, um, if you have an abusive coach, you know, physically sure, or mentally, sure. you know, and I, when I, I term abuse a lot different than most people, um, I think you'd have to be pretty drastic to be abusive, in my opinion, you know, with your with the terms you use. And because I've seen people that use uh, not the best language, but their heart is pure. And so my dad always said, you know, make sure you filter the words and the message messenger and listen to the message. Mm-hmm. Um, and so back to that. Um, you know, I don't ever think there's really a good reason to quit. I would just say you you just come to an end, if that makes sense. So sure. So when the Rockies decided not to re-sign me and I went and played, um, you know, with the with the Gary Railcats in 2010 and I my body couldn't recover. I mean, I'm just taking a uniform away from somebody else. It was over. Right. Mm. That that mm. that's that to me is the time to quit. If until that kind of time comes. If you do quit, you're basically raising the white flag and saying to everyone else, you were right. I wasn't good enough. So I feel like in baseball, maybe it's more than any other sport, but you have these these rough around the edges type characters as coaches. And maybe that's just stereotypical baseball. But when you think of the great coaches that you've encountered, one, what's that commonality you see in them among the great ones? And then what is that one common trait among bad coaches that you've had? My favorite coaches were brutally honest. They were brutal. They, they would say, you were horrible yesterday. Or, you know, you didn't come into spring training in shape. And you, you if you don't start working hard, you're not going to have a spot on this team. You're not going to have a spot on any team, right? The coaches that I could not stand to play for were the ones that would smile at your face, tell you everything was great, right? Use all the great flowery words and then turn around and stab you right in the back and had zero problems doing it. So I was a big uh, proponent of, you know, and, and, and some of those direct coaches obviously had accusations thrown at them because they were so brutally honest, you know, and maybe they didn't use the right words. Okay. But you never had to question where you stood with those people. The ones that were using the flowery language and and, you know, oh, yeah, you know, you, you, you are just so great. Um, those are the ones you have to, you know, make sure you check check your back a couple of times for the knives. So I, I struggle playing for those guys. So how do you explain that? You, you know, you work with developing kids in the game, but you also are in in professional life. I feel like if you put that hardcore 
traditional rough around the edges baseball coach in a boardroom in a business context maybe it doesn't quite play like people are, are bristling at that brutal honesty are you able to translate those kinds of lessons into your work or do you find yourself people kind of have trouble with the language that you're using or you have to use different language than you you would use that you uh that you used in athletics well, that's a great question. And I actually have some experience with this. So I, I, when I left baseball, I became an executive in a small engineering firm called LHP. And when I first went in there, um, you know, I, I, I tried the brutal, honest approach in the executive boardrooms and yeah, it wasn't very well received. Um, and quite frankly, I was a rookie and, I, and looking back when I did that, it was definitely my fault. Like I didn't, I didn't take the time <laughs> to build the trust. Yeah. Um, I just called it like I saw it and I learned a ton in that environment on how to listen and then speak uh, because I would speak and then listen. Well, that doesn't work in the business and professional environment. You want to listen to what the pain points other people are feeling. And then when you speak, if it is truthful, a lot of times they feel like, OK, and they know that you actually care what they are going through. So like, for example, if you go into the finance department asking for something and you know it's the right thing to ask for, but you never listen to them talk about the budgeting process or, or how, how another group is asking for too much, then you have no context for the person you're speaking with and their mood they're in, right? So it was a, it was a challenge. I'm really thankful that the CEO of LHP gave me the opportunity. I was able to grow a, a really cool business unit for him that my wife actually works in now. Um, but no, it, it, it is like, and that is one big mistake I think a lot of professional athletes make is right. they assume that because they made it to the top in one area, that that automatically transfers into great skills and techniques in another area. And it does not. That brutal honesty, it's so interesting. So you didn't find great coaches were necessarily great listeners. They just imposed their will. They weren't, you know, checking in on their players, how they did the night before. It was more like, we have a job to do. You're up. He's down. More of that kind of a style. Yeah, I would say for baseball and basketball, yes. that that's the, Those are the people that I, re, I respected the most, just because I knew where I stood on the team. You know, we went to dinner and hung out, but – but I understood the lines. They, they were clear on where the lines were. So when did you understand you were good enough to make it in the majors? Was there any point, I know you were in the minor leagues for many years, was there any point there where you thought, I'm not good enough, there's a lot of doubt? Or was there just one moment where you said, I know I can do this, I know that I have this talent, full steam ahead? Yeah, so um, there were several um, areas where I should not have made it. And I made some changes and, and then I was able to drive through. Um, I would say that in uh, 2006, when I was in the relief uh, area again in AAA with the, the Colorado Springs Sky Sox, and I, I think I led the team in appearances. I gave up three home runs all year long uh, in, in altitude. Um, had a phenomenal year. Actually, um, there was rumors that I might get called up that year. I, I felt like that year I was good enough. And then I went to Mexico and played there and, and I performed down there. Um, but I would say that really um, I always felt like I had the ability uh, and, and I don't mean to sound arrogant that way, but I felt like, you know, I, I had the physical abilities, but the mental approach to the game always held me back. So I would get concerned about, what my teammates were doing on, you know, on how they were performing. Right. And I had to learn that they're my teammates, right? Like we're supposed to root for each other. And that actually enabled me to build great bonds with friends after the game now, because mm. I started to treat them like teammates instead of competitors. Right. Right. I would make the game bigger than it was. And I had to see several sports psychologists to learn how to control my emotions because my emotions were not always under control as some people that are close to me can attest that I had to learn how to control those under pressure situations. Um, so I would say probably, I mean, I was in a rotation 
uh, with Zach Greinke in 2002. And I can't believe you said that because as soon as you were talking about mental toughness in baseball, that's who came to mind. So how, how do you explain a guy like him, like Zach Greinke, who is so brilliant, he has so many quirks, so idiosyncratic, uh, he's almost, he's a baseball savant in a sense. What did you learn playing with him? He has zero fear, none. Okay. The guy was the best pitcher, like executing pitches that I have ever seen in my life because he had no fear. He had supreme confidence in what he was doing and zero fear. And he was going to do it his way. Did that translate off the field as well? So if someone just met Zach Greinke on the street, would they think, oh, this guy has no fear in anything he does? I don't think they would get that from meeting him off the field. I, I, I have not talked to him in several years. So I, I can't, but I can tell you that when I, when I was teammates with him, my wife and I had great relationships with him. You know, he's unique, but he's also, you know, I mean, there's always uh, uh, quirks to genius is what I would say. You, yeah. I don't know one genius person out there that doesn't have their quirks. What would you say was the most important lesson you learned about emotional regulation, emotional control going through that process? It either controls you or you control it. So when it's controlling you, it, it's a big, big problem. And it's something I have to work on even to this day. Um, but when you learn how to control it yourself, and especially in pressure situations, wow, the power there is in that. I mean, it's it's a very powerful thing. So your mind is so powerful and you just don't know it until you start to control it a little bit. Was that perseverance you learned? Was that the most important lesson that lasted beyond baseball? Or is there another lesson that stands out as more important? Something you learned in your athletic career that you've translated to your professional career? Perseverance is definitely up there. But I would also say that um when you're in baseball professionally, you have people from a lot of different backgrounds, including some that don't necessarily speak great English. Sometimes you're, you're in an environment that you're speaking English and that's not the, the native language. Um, people from all different parts of life look, you know, regions, and somehow you have to find a way to work together. So I think, you know, if you're going to be in business, I think the strongest businesses have uh, diverse thought in their leadership. And, and, um, you know, so it kind of goes back to those, those, uh, coaches that were direct. They always had other coaches that were softer to kind of soften the blow. And they always had them around cause they knew that's what they needed. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that's the, the, the greatest thing I learned in sports is that everybody can provide value if you're willing to listen and you're willing to yeah. learn their story. Right. If you're not willing to listen and learn their story, and, um, you know, th then essentially you become enemies with everyone and you're too arrogant to realize that you're surrounded by enemies. Right. Um, so I would say working with others is probably the best thing I learned from sports. Zach, to end our conversation, I'm going to do some rapid fire questions if you're willing. Sure. First, what is the most effective way to trash talk a pitcher? Uh, call time in the middle of a pitch and yell at him. What is the best baseball movie ever made? Ooh, great question. Bull Durham is just extremely accurate. I'll go Bull Durham. What's one change you would make to the minor league baseball system if you were in charge for a day? I would allow AAA and single A teams to play each other. I would love to see the best A ball teams take on AAA teams here and there because I think it would be interesting because baseball is such a game of you know, technique that I think, I think it would be exciting for people to watch. It would be even better if they allowed the A-ball champions to get in a tournament against the double-A AA and triple-A champions and have a true minor league world champion. What is the single biggest reason for baseball's decline in popularity? If I had to name one thing, I would say that baseball and the youth levels has become a little bit like golf in that if you have the best driver, you're going to hit it the farthest. So the equipment has become more expensive. I would have a hard time believing that Babe Ruth could have afforded to play in travel ball. And I run a travel ball organization, right? As a part of my, one of the companies I own. Right. So, so the reality is I think it, I think by doing that, you're, you're, you're taking a segment of the, of the population and you're saying you can't play this. 
Um, so that's hurting the, the numbers in the game a little bit. But I also think the system for those other players is broken. So when you have a political driven system, people are going to go find a different way to play where there's less politics involved and it's more about the game, if that makes sense access and somehow get fairness back in the game. And that not doesn't mean just economically. It also means like based on talent and merit instead of, you know, money or who's on the board. But I'm talking about even at the youth, like I played youth, youth rec league, but at the time the board was about getting, getting us the proper uniforms, having fair play, uh, judging you based on your talent. Right. That's not been my experience recently with youth boards. It's somebody, and I'm not saying all this, I do not paint everything with the same brush. I mean, you have to take every situation individually, right? But I will say, I see a lot of boards that are run by people that are positioning for whatever reason, and it's not about the sport. I think that has more of an impact on kids not wanting to play than the socioeconomic problem. Because if you're Mm. a parent, and you can pay 20 bucks for your kid to play baseball in a fair and competitive way, or you have to pay $2,000, which one are you going to pick? So it, te- it should be a sign that the system is broken and it needs repaired, in my opinion. Zach McClellan, thank you so much again for joining us on America's Talking. Really appreciate it.